What's up, Lions of Liberty fans? You can now support this show on Patreon and get exclusive access to bonus audio and video content, including Conspiracy Corner, Degenerate Gamblers, bonus segments with guests, and so much more. Head on over to patreon.com slash Lions of Liberty. Welcome to Electric Liberty Land here on the Lions of Liberty podcast, your weekly shot of culture, comedy, and liberty with your host, Brian McWilliams. Hey, 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 what's up, sailors upon these liberty seas, avast ye hardies and yo-ho. Welcome to Electric Liberty Land, episode number 76. Of course, I am Brian McWilliams, the captain on the good ship Liberty, and also coincidentally on the good ship Lollipop. Yes, the good ship Lollipop. It's a straight trip to the candy shop. And uh, where I will be there creepily staring at you from behind the counter. Now then, this being episode number 76 means you can find all of the show notes for today's episode at www.lionsofliberty.com forward slash ELL76. And I do want to remind you guys to listen to our other shows as you tune into mine. Mark Clare with our flagship show on Mondays, talking to leaders of the libertarian movement. And John Odie Odermatt on Fridays on, with his fantastic show, Felony Friday, which examines the injustices within the ironically named criminal justice system. So make sure you guys check that stuff out. They are two fantabulous shows. And while you're at it, please do share the show. We're trying to grow this bastard and we need your help. So uh, hopefully some of you are brand new listeners to this very episode. So welcome, welcome aboard. Now, it's very an incredible week. Something happened this week that has never, ever happened before. And yet we still have so many people that are, are throwing shade and casting doubt upon this, this incredible happening. And of course, by that, you all know what I'm talking about. Yes, the International House of Pancakes flipped its logo, flipped the P into a B. And uh, going against the common thread of thought, which was one one with my own, that this was going to be the International House of Breakfast, they instead went with International House of Burgers. <laughs> now, bigger things have been going on since that, but I just want to tar- start it off with that because it's so stupid. How many burger joints do we need? We got McDonald's, we got Burger King, who is dead to me because of the net neutrality horse shit that they pulled. We've got Carl's Jr. also dead to me because of the horse or the net neutrality horse shit that they just pulled. I'm going to talk about that later in the show. No, there's more better, bigger, better things to talk about, obviously. Like, like the real first time ever gathering that was just held between President Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un of North Korea. The first time a U.S. leader has sat down with a leader of the North Korean regime since that country was founded, of course, following the Korean War, wherein the Soviet Union took one side of the country. We uh, sliced and diced it. The USA (laughs) took leadership of the other side, effectively. And uh, the Democratic side, well, the the ironically Democratic side, the DPRK, of course, was under more communist rule and uh, became a socialist Utopia, as they always do, where people are starving, led by a cruel and ridiculous family of dictators. And then we've got the uh, South Koreans who have excelled in every possible way, who have cell phones that I believe right now can actually turn into robots. You can strap them to your feet and fly around the world at pretty sure hyperspeed, like hypersonic break the sound barrier speed. Or something at least close. I think maybe the next Galaxy update that they actually have there will finally merge man and machine into the transhumanistic vision that some libertarians have, including Zoltan Istvan, who was on this show, but sadly did not get to uh, move forward with his political aspirations in the state of California. Now then, let's talk a little bit about this North Korean summit. Because starting right out of the gate, you're reading... I mean, virtually every mass media network, with maybe the exception of Fox News, but even they have so many neocons at that network that want to come down on this meeting between Trump and uh, and Kim Jong, which, of course, really is being spearheaded not only by Trump, because Trump's he's been a lot of fire and fury and aggressive talk and and taking credit, which is not fully due for getting Kim Jong under the table. Now, granted, 
his rhetoric did have something to do with it. And there was even a recent story where Donald Trump said, well, he regrets calling <laughs> calling Kim Jong-un little rocket man. Uh, but he said, you know, it was the rhetoric that got us here. And he is partially correct. That bombastic attitude that no holds barred, we will, we will rock you, uh, will, in fact, go down as having something to do with getting Kim Jong to the table because he really, he you know, he bought into the madman theory. Of course, being that you have to come across as the madman in the scenario to bring somebody that's in that says, okay, well, then in that case, I have to negotiate. I need to be the sane person here. And of course, it helped, even though I despise the man, to bring in John Bolton to take place as Secretary of State. And we all know John Bolton's opinion of North Korea, and he has uh, no hesitation to get us into all sorts of wars, to push all sorts of buttons. Also falling in that category would be uh, one... I don't even know what you describe him. A uh, a dumpling of a shit of a man, maybe you know, like an undigested Chinese dumpling you might enjoy at your uh, at your dim sum brunch that went straight through your body, came out somewhat covered in your own feces, but still maintained its white dumpling esque shape in Senator Lindsey Graham. Because Senator Lindsey Graham was on record and is on record going around not only to Republicans but also petitioning to the neocons in the Democratic Party, which we know, of course, there are many trying to get them to sign an authorization for the use of military force, which, of course, is why we're still messing around in Afghanistan and messing around in Iraq and messing around in all these other places, Syria included. But Lindsey Graham is trying to get people to sign an authorization for the use of military force just in case, according to Lindsey, just in case Donald Trump doesn't manage to get enough concessions from North Korea, just in case things don't work out, just peachy keen when they sit down together. Who in their right mind would do that? Who in their right mind would sign it? Thank God everybody told him to go shove it. But who in their right mind would sign it? And that is, as Rand Paul said it, dangerous. Lindsey Graham is a danger to our country. When you take this kind of approach, and this is before the summit. This isn't after somebody came out. This isn't like news broke from the summit that Kim Jong-un had relayed back to his generals to start arming things, and we had to mobilize our military to quickly take action. No, what did he think? That Kim Jong-un and Dennis Rodman were going to somehow hypnotize Trump, get him to, to give them all our nuclear codes and lay down all their weapons and just immediately roll over dead? I mean, in what world would we need to have a use for the military, authorization for the use of military force, just in case things didn't go well, just in case... You know, and, and how is that going to help negotiating? To go into this summit, which is intended to bring these countries together, to bring us back from the brink of nuclear war, which I would argue we were never on anyway, but to bring us back at least from even looking in that direction, from even giving a, a wolf whistle at a nuclear bomb. So let's take a step back from that. Instead of instead of trying to push forth this, this is authorization and hold that over his head as he's coming for this first ever in the history of the world meeting between North Korea and the United States of America. I mean, God damn it, Lindsey Graham. I, I don't understand how he keeps getting elected. I don't understand how anybody even listens to a word the man has to say when he comes out with this kind of idiotic garbage over and over again in his lilting voice that I despise. All right, so let's get down to it. Basically... This this meeting, uh, this meeting of minds, which, by the way, 86 percent of South Koreans absolutely are, are over the moon about the country that would be immediately annihilated should things have gone spectacularly badly between Trump and North Korea. Eighty six percent of South Koreans are over the moon about this. Eighty seven percent of South Koreans vastly approve uh, su- uh, you know, President Moon's job that he's done there, who took office specifically with denuclearization in mind with reunification of possibility and with the direct intent to have better relations between North and South Korea, to rein in the animosity that's been going back and forth. And the man's done spectacularly with, of course, with Donald Trump's help. You know, I, wh- where would this be without Big Brother America? I really don't know. I mean, the, obviously the threat of, uh, of America's power helped South Korea in a way. But at the same time, you have to believe that the fact that America was there with troops on the border, with all this firepower behind them, also stopped South Korea from taking so much part in raising their own military up that may have been its own 
threat to North Korea enough to deter them from taking any action against them in the first place. Much as we've seen with Japan, where they spent like 1% of their GDP on their military over years, and now that's starting to get ratcheted up again, as the U.S. says, we're not going to pay for this anymore. you got to take care of yourselves. Now, the, the reason people are throwing so much shade, as alluded to earlier at this meeting, was that nothing concrete came out of it. There was no signed peace treaty. There was no signed declaration or, or timetable put in place for denuclearization. Uh, and the U.S., according to Trump, again, nothing signed. But Trump did give some at least spoken guarantees to Kim Jong-un about some security concerns for the United States, basically saying the United States will not come in and fuck up your shit. Verbally, anyway. And it was you know, in a, a declaration, though, again, not a treaty in any way, way shape or form. So people are saying, oh, well, Kim Jong-un got everything he wanted out of this. I, I, exactly what did he get out of it other than uh, an assurance from Trump? Who, you know, Trump's opinion uh, blows along the wind uh, like a, a feather falling out of a seagull's ass. So who knows which way he's going to blow tomorrow. But he got a guarantee from Trump that could mean nothing, especially considering, you know, look at the Iran deal. They had a, a guarantee from Obama that means nothing. But he got a guarantee that we would not uh, take take action against them should they denuclearize. We also got, a, I'm sure he got some sort of guarantee as well that the United States would aid if they were ever to be attacked from some other superpower that we ha- tend to view as an enemy. Again, this is, this is me reading into it. And Kim Jong, in the meantime, he's been pledging to denuclearize and he's gone so far as to collapse nuclear sites, to collapse roads going to nuclear sites, to collapse all sorts of things on documented video that you can see that they've shared that's been verified by satellite imaging. So he's actually taking these steps and it makes complete sense in that way too, because just, you know, North Korea over the past 10 years under Kim Jong-un has also taken steps to bring their economy somewhat in line with the way world economies under a capitalist system work. Kim Jong-un, you know, a, a goofy little jigglypuff that he is, does in fact have enough of a mind on him to realize that his country was going down the shitter quickly, that there there's no way to stop the leaks from information from coming in in from the outside. These South Korean soap operas, I think have done more damage to North Korea than anything else, but people are seeing the way that the South lives. They're seeing these people have vastly more of everything than we do under this capitalist system. Let me pause for a minute as a goddamn ambulance drives by. All right. They've seen that under the capitalist system that they've been over-propagandized to supposedly despise, that people are thriving, that people's families aren't being taken away, that they're not starving to death, that they have a million different choices of goods and services, that they're able to travel freely between nations. Now, Kim Jong-un is not opening up the borders and, and completely adopting a capitalist system, but he is taking slow and steady steps towards that direction. We're seeing that he's opening up more to trade. He's opening up more to capital to uh, capitalism. And as such, over the past 10 years, the state of North Korea has improved dramatically. And that's just with a teardrop worth of capitalism involved. So for all these socialist assholes that want to stick their guns in the ground and say, well, you know what? You know, it just has never been done right. And you know, this and that and the other. We're seeing the effects of capitalism play out. And this is just, this is the most restricted version of capitalism you can have. And already you're seeing the base, the base level where people are starving in the hundreds of thousands is reduced dramatically to the point where now the projections say, you know, that it's something like maybe at at most 10,000 people have starved, you know, which is still not great, but pretty goddamn big improvement. So this is, I mean, no matter what you want to say about it, an incredible step forward. Just the sitting down, just getting all three of them together, the committing to denuclearization combined with this capitalist instinct that Kim Jong-un is showing. And, you know, if if Donald Trump can pull back on some of the sanctions, if Kim Jong-un continues to pull back with the militarization, continues to pull back on some of these these atrocities that he's committed. And look, I'm not defending Kim Jong-un or saying that he's a great guy. You know, people have to say that. Oh, so you think Kim Jong-un's a great guy? No, fuck. Of course not. He's an abomination. He's horrible. But for the sake of his people, you need to take that out of your mind for now and try to root for what's going to get them closer to freedom, closer to liberty, closer to capitalism. 
And it's the same thing with Donald Trump. While I will hail Donald Trump for bringing Kim Jong-un to the table, for getting this process started, and for pushing through with something we thought was going to be done and gone, you know, as of two weeks ago, I'll give him all the credit in the world. Now, what I won't give him credit for is the continuation of all these wars that Obama continued, you know, that, that were started by Bush, continued by other Bush, uh, continued and expanded under Obama. And now Donald Trump is taking part in them. Now, he was in, I can't say that he is accelerating them in the way that Obama did and expanding them to the extent Obama did by going all over goddamn Africa, all over the broader Middle East, getting us involved in every place he possibly could while drone bombing people enough to run out of bombs and killing Americans without any due process. But, and, and, and of course, let's not forget about Yemen and uh, and all and the proxy where the U.S. is taking part in over there, uh, lending the Saudis all the bombs and blockades that they can use to cause a, a absolute genocide of a people and babies dying of cholera all over. I'm not ignoring that. That's heinous. But give credit where credit is due. Donald Trump deserves credit for doing this. Kim Jong-un deserves credit for doing this. For the sake of the North Korean people, we need to knock off this horse shit where everybody's attacking this. For, and this is, again, mostly people on the left. These are progressives and, neo, well, it's progressives and neocons who can get together on more things than, than you think when it comes to this kind of thing, barely, because the hatred of Trump has many, many allies uh, when it comes to apparently ignoring the benefits of stopping a, a population from starving to death. So that's my take on North Korea for now. We're going to see what's coming out of this. Uh, in the wake of this, I do want to talk about one other story in regards to to Trump, and that is Robert De Niro at the Tonys taking the the bold, bold approach to stand up to Donald Trump in front of a room full of crony dickheads sitting in a comfy New York theater, rich as they can possibly be, eating caviar off each other's asses, and uh, and and politely clapping. For people that are winning Broadway musicals that cost several million dollars, if not hundreds of millions of dollars to put on to stage these productions and pay the cast, these massive casts that cost no fewer than 50 to 80 to $200 a ticket, depending on the place that you're sitting in. And that take up theaters that were built on the, on the heels of, of uh, large yes. So all these people sit in this comfy environment and rail against Donald Trump, the the leader of which is Robert De Niro at the most recent Tony Awards. I don't know what he won for. I couldn't give two shits. But he stands up there and goes on a uh, a tirade against Trump, which ended with, or I included therein, him saying, fuck Trump and getting a standing ovation from these people. Because, as you said, you know, people with this much money, they could give two shits about the tax cuts. They could give two shits about the regulations that Trump has cut down that are enabling businessmen to succeed, that are enabling the economy to chug along at a better pace. They could give two shits. They don't really give it. They pretend to care about free trade. They don't. And a quick aside about that with just t- talking about Trudeau. Uh, by the way, I have no problem with Trump telling Trudeau and the rest of the G G six countries there to uh, to go step a take a long walk off a short pier. Fine with that, but I love all these people saying, "Oh, well, okay, you know, Trump said him and he's attacking Trudeau and the free trade." And I like Trump's statement that it should be open and free trade. His his comments are correct that the USA does pay very high tariffs to a very very many countries. But as I said last episode, they. The other countries that are coming in where it's pay so many more regulative tariffs, uh, local, state, protectionist system, like all sorts of things are set up against them where the U.S. still has the highest tariffs almost, almost anybody. And it's absurd. But that being said, Donald Trump is correct when he says that free trade should be free trade. And uh, as if you're a libertarian, you should stand behind that, even if his understanding of it is a little bit skewed. Now then. Back to the Tony Awards and asshole De Niro. So yeah, just I just can't get over that Robert De Niro, as Donald Trump is sitting down just to try to denuclearize North Korea in a world first, Robert De Niro gets up there and says, fuck Trump. And everybody just jumps right on his jock and starts dancing around. And I want to read to you one of Donald Trump's absolute best responses that he's ever had. I mean, <laughs> you gotta get the guy credit. He really, uh, he really comes up with some zingers. So this is what Donald Trump tweeted out 
in response, and this was just today, or actually this is yesterday as of uh, the time this will air. He tweets, Robert De Niro, comma, a very low Q- IQ individual, has received too many shots to the head by real boxers in movies. <laughs> I, I watched him last night and truly believe he may be punch drunk. I guess he doesn't realize the economy is the best it's ever been, with employment being at an all-time high and many, many companies pouring back into our country. Wake up, punchy! <laughs> <laughs> Wake up, Punchy. By the way, may be my new sign off for Electric Liberty Land. You know, instead of uh, good, no- good night and good luck, I'm just going to end every Electric Liberty Land with always stay plugged into Liberty and Wake up, Punchy. God, that is hilarious. Absolutely freaking hilarious. All right. Tell you what. We're going to take a little break, see, and I'll be right back to go into some stuff with net neutrality and a few other uh, quick shots for you. We don't rise to the level of our expectations. We fall to the level of our training. Those epic words from Archilochus can sum up your ability to succeed or fail in business. I want to recommend Conversation Mat Time to our listeners as a way to hone your one-on-one conversation skills in a role-playing session that can help take you to the next level. During 25-minute sessions, you'll work through the best way to approach that raise, that interview, or that relationship with a practice professional that will provide the confidence and experience you need to get paid what you're worth or take that interpersonal risk you've never been able to conquer. Just like in jiu-jitsu, the difference between a novice and a black belt is mat time train to win. Visit conversationmattime.com and take advantage of a free 15-minute consultation just for listeners of this show. Okie dokie, Smokies. We are back with Electric Liberty Land episode 76. Again, all the show notes, lionsofliberty.com forward slash ELL76. And don't forget to check out the archives, which uh, I am trying to remember to update. And we're going to have somebody working on that for us soon, so we won't have to do it. But you can find all the archives for the show at lionsofliberty.com forward slash ELL. You might have figured that out on your own, but hey, I never know how smart my audience is. I think smart, but then again, I'm pretty stupid myself. <laughs> Who knows? So let's jump into net neutrality here. And if you don't know, I did a uh, a pretty epic show about net neutrality. I did one of my famous drunk talks or bar talk segments wherein I very in-depthly explain net neutrality. And of course, the irony is the, the bar talk segment is uh, supposed to wrap it up in a in a, sh- a very summarized version you can actually share at a bar, but I did a very epic rant upon it because it needed it, goddammit, because people were really pissing me off. So if you're curious in hearing that, in educating yourself all about net neutrality, you could go to uh, lionsofliberty.com forward slash ELL48. I've also put it in the show notes for this show. And uh, if you're just listening on your phone, just scroll on backwards, guys. We haven't put those episodes behind a paywall yet. Yet. So you can check it out and give it a listen. But I figured, you know what? This gives me a brand new opportunity to do it right this time around. So let's hit it. Let's, let's, do, a little, let's do a little bar talking about net neutrality. Cliff, explanation, please. Now, how do you know he has one? Five bucks says he does, ten says it's a doozy. Maybe it's a beer talking, Mark, but you got a butt that won't quit. They got these big chewy pretzels here that are all you guys with your beer. You know, Five dollars? Get out of here. All right, so here we go. A little bar talk about net neutrality. So in a nutshell, net neutrality is supposed to be the equalization of access to the internet, and specifically, it is supposed to stop... ISPs from picking and choosing, quote, winners and losers from businesses or personal people when they're using the services. So, for instance, net neutrality is supposed to stop people like Netflix, giant companies that use up some 70% of all data at one point was going through Netflix, from being charged more by ISPs to use a, quote, fast lane or being required to pay more to use a fast lane to get you that content. Because in a, according to the net neutrality proponents, if this was left unregulated, what would happen is that Netflix would get their data slowed down because they didn't want to pay more, right? So if they if they don't want to pay anymore, then your ISP, whoever it may be, can say, well, 
fine, but you're using so much data going out to so many different consumers, we're going to slow out that stream of data. Now, if you want to speed that up, we can facilitate that. The reason that ISPs are actually right to demand this is that the way the internet works actually is a finite resource. There is only so much cable and so much broadband that can go around. And the way it's set up basically is that the data comes in, you've got high-speed fiber optic cables, but you also have some kind of overwash cables that are older, copper wiring, etc., that they can still route signals through. However, they travel much more slowly. And what happens when you have a massive amount of data that hits this finite resource is that they have to, as an ISP, work harder, set up different programs, have different people to administrate and filter all of that data through these other networks so that it will arrive in a reasonable period of time. And now if they are overburdened in, a, in an unregulated environment, right, where you'd have incentive to assure faster and faster uh, communications, where you didn't want to ensure faster and faster ability for companies to communicate data, especially in a, a video heavy, advertising heavy world, everybody's FaceTiming, texting, et cetera, you would say, okay, well, you know, you're incentivized as an ISP to create bigger, faster portals to get this through because you can then create bigger, faster portals and market those bigger, faster portals to companies that are using this massive amount of data. You can go to a Netflix and say, hey, we've created a special service so your customers are not going to have to wait as long. They're always going to get this assured data stream at this incredibly high speed. And there's already private companies that do this. I used to represent one. They were called SohoNet. They work with the visual effects industry. They zipped incredibly high-speed transfers through across oceans, no problem. But you know what? They paid for it, and they paid well for it. So when you're talking to your idiot friends at the bar, and they say, well, you know, why, why should, why should they, you know, they get to pick and choose who goes faster or slower? Well, here's a way to think about it, right? You've got a road. The road's got four lanes. If you have one truck that's taking up three lanes of that road, you're going to have a traffic jam that's backing up behind that truck that takes up three lanes. Everybody else is only taking up one lane. Why should this truck get special uh, consideration when everybody else is, is getting the same exact, you know, kind of shit way? Okay, we're going to, we have to back up behind this truck. We got to slip around the side of this truck. That truck is Netflix. Now, if they said, okay, you can't have that truck on this road right now because it's not fair to everybody else, which is the case that's happening, by the way, it is not fair to everyone else that's trying to use the internet to have this system wherein you everybody pays equally, everybody has equal access, but one person is using 70% of it. Logically, how is that going to work out for the rest of us? But if you had then a service, they say, okay, look, three lane wide truck. You can't have this access all by yourself. You either have to pay a special rate to have access to these roads and we'll make it a little wider for you so everybody else can go around and you can go around and you don't have to wait for other cars either. It's better for everybody. We all win. If they said that, wouldn't that make sense? Wouldn't it make the most sense for somebody that's taking up a massive amount of space on that road and forget who built it, my roads, but wouldn't it make the most sense to have that person pay more and if that regards, you know, if that ends up in them charging their customers a little bit more for a service, well, that's a choice that they have to make. Either their customers complain and in the free market system, what happens? Well, the company either says, all right, we're going to find out what the market will bear to pay a little bit more or to charge a little bit more to have an assured faster service. Or we say, no, we're not going to pay, you know, we're not going to raise your rates. If this is what the market will bear, that's fine. But this is what you get. This is the service offering. And if somebody can come along and find a better way to do that, then so be it. They will then step up. And in a broader sense, that's what Agent Pi's point is about innovation when it comes to the internet industry. Internet exploded in a deregulated environment. As soon as regulation got put into place, all of the innovation slowed down, all of the infrastructure build-outs slowed down because it's not government handling the infrastructure build-outs. It's individual ISPs and individual companies. And when you take the incentive out for those companies to make money, which is, by the way, what they're there for, what would be the point of them improving their product in any way? And there's one more thing I want to add at the end of this because I don't want to go too long. Again, this is supposed to be the short talk on net neutrality. So I'm trying to sum it up as best I can. But the other point of being is that 
You know what? They use these straw man arguments to argue against net neutrality. They say, oh, well, what if you block a website like at one point AT&T tried to block FaceTime? Well, I'll tell you what happens. People say, hey, what the fuck? And they then complain about it to the news. They complain about it to their friends. They complain about it on social media. They complain about it to everyone and anything. And they blow it up. And the company then says, you know what? We're sorry. We messed up. We're retracting it. We're backing up. At no point are these companies blocking any access to news sites. Are they blocking access to any uh, any propaganda coming in them that's anti-whatever company? Unless they're private entities like Facebook. Who wasn't an ISP? They're supposed to be a uh, news source. Because Facebook blocks complaining articles about Facebook at times. Uh, that's the point. Is that any, th- any argument you hear against it is just simply a worst case scenario created by the left or created by any opponent by uh, for net neutrality, including the biggest content creators like Facebook, like Netflix, like Apple. Those are the companies that are getting together and spending all this money to push forth these ridiculous things. Big industry that's based in content creation because they're the ones who are going to suffer from it. Not the consumers who never suffered from it before net neutrality was put into place all the way back you know, four goddamn years ago. No, the consumers suffer for it now under this regulation. Once it's gone, and hopefully it's going to be gone. It's zombie. The zombie course of net neutrality continues to roam the land because states now are fighting for it. These cronyist states. Once it's gone, I hope it stays gone, but we'll see. The fight continues, my friends. But I hope that was at least somewhat helpful to you. Again, I, I do recommend you listen to the full episode I did on it. It really goes into it. And uh, you get a good grasp of what you want to talk about if you give it a, give it a good listen. Okay, let's move on. I'm going to do a couple quick stories because I'm starting to sweat to death. It's hot in L.A. today, and my little studio does not have A.C. Hopefully the new house I will move into, if our (laughs) luck is good, will be a little cooler. But I got to crow a little bit on something. I got to do a little little Seahawk cackling. I don't even know what a Seahawk sounds like. It's probably close. And that, of course, is in regards to the City Council of Seattle backing the fuck up on this idiotic plan to put forth the quote-unquote Amazon tax that would have put something to the tune of 27 cents per hour on every single employee of any company within city limits that had a revenue of over $20 million a year. The dumbest thing that I've ever heard of. And I just, you know, in truth, I was kind of rooting for it. I was kind of rooting for the tax to go forward only in the way, of course, I say this as I'm telling other, I'm telling assholes on the left not to root against Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un, but, but for the greater good, I was rooting for it in that I was rooting for this tax to go through just because I wanted it to be one of those situations where you see a city that grew large based upon capitalism, based upon entrepreneurship, based upon an economy that was rolling along start to tax itself literally to death. I wanted to see Seattle tax itself so deeply that that flying Seahawk just became a pile of bones that would smash into a side of the building and fall to the concrete. That's what I wanted the city council of Seattle to be. I wanted to see them smack into a window, crack it, and then fall to the floor. Because this tax was one of the dumbest things ever created. I mean, talk about a way that you're going to drive every profitable business out of your city. Any business that even approaches that possibility of a $20 million threshold is going to flee the city in a second. Leaving this, you know, they have all these homeless that have been pushed out because of, basically because of the success of the city and the inability of the city's housing to keep up with it, which by the way, also always happens in progressively dominated city environments because they try to regulate the shit out of housing and it slows it down even farther. But all that money that would have gone towards the homeless are trying to raise, good luck. Good luck. The homeless will be able to find housing again because they'll move into all the vacant buildings that are that are lying around, Detroit style. Go start some fires in some apartment buildings in a trash can. Go cook some hobo hot dogs around it. So let me just crow because Seattle's backed off of that. And while it's good, while I'm happy to see that, at the same time, I'm a little sad because I did want to dance on that festering corpse of a progressive city just for a little while. All right. Now that I've gotten that out of my system, let's move on to our uh, final story of the day, which is 
The question of who will build the roads has finally, finally been answered, my friends. And the answer to that is Domino's Pizza. Because (laughs) Domino's Pizza is seeing all these cities, a lot of smaller towns are getting hit by uh, basically not be able to make their ends meet in regards to taxes. Because once you start overtaxing people, they start to leave. And what happens is that you start having big budget shortfalls because they have projected budgets, they have guaranteed budgets, they have pension overheads, they have all sorts of these, these little programs they put into place, which add up very, very quickly. And you make all these guarantees when things are rolling along under a, a nice free capitalist system. And then you decide to get greedy. And a lot of companies, or not a lot of companies, excuse me, a lot of counties, a lot of cities have gotten very, very greedy and they find themselves with massive budget shortfalls. So they can't fix the roads. So who will build the roads now? Well, as I said, Domino's Pizza. Because Domino's now, they've already done it in a few different cities, but they're taking people, you know, you can, you can send them in like an online application or tweet at them or something like that. Tell them about the city you're in. And it's pothole problem or it's problem with, you know, whatever little, mi- it's some like minor street issues, but typically it's potholes and Domino's will send a truck out with professional asphalters or whatever you, you'd call them. And, uh, they go out professionally, uh, cram that ass right in that pothole and smooth it out. And they put a little Domino's logo on it and then they move along. And now don't get me wrong. I guarantee you. Women who listen to uh, Jody Mitchell's and, uh, you know, paved over the parking lot and paved over the, the thing, you know, that stupid goddamn hippie song. People that love that song and hate corporations are going to say, oh, this is just a PR stunt. To which I respond, I don't care. I don't care if charity is a PR stunt. In fact, a lot of charity is done as a tax write off or done as a positive publicity, corporate responsibility change. And that's driven by social media response and people liking that product. A lot of people actually get fond because of a brand. When you have brands that are out there that are virtually indistinguishable, they can become far more positively inclined towards that brand because of the corporate responsibility initiatives those companies take. They don't just do it because they feel bad. And if they say they're due, they're full of shit anyway. Just like I was listening to a recent philosophical conversation about libertarianism versus classic liberalism. I think it was on the Rubin Report. And it is true Really, almost anything you do is not a selfless act. It's done because it makes you feel good or it's going to make somebody else impressed with you. Why is it any different for a corporation? Good. You want to give money to save children? Fantastic. I hope you do. Capitalism's working. The free market's working. You're doing that voluntarily. It's helping people and it gives gives you more profits at the end of the day. Great. Domino's. Great publicity stunt. Hope it never ends. I wouldn't give two shits if every road in every state had all its potholes covered in logos. Give me all the corporate logos I can take because I'd rather have corporate logos filling holes that fucking bankrupt cities can't fill and they're breaking my axles and popping my goddamn tires and ruining traffic for me. I'd rather have that happen than just allow these things to continue as they are. And you know what? As a result, we can lower taxes, can't we? We can get rid of some of these workers that sit around picking their asses all day on the side of the road, getting paid $25 an hour because they're in a goddamn union to have eight guys on the side of a street for four days to do a block's worth of work. Well, two guys work and the other six guys hold signs to tell me to slow down. Give me some good corporate PR to fix my roads and lower my goddamn taxes. I love it. So God bless you, Domino's. You will build the roads. Hashtag my roads. All right. I am finishing up. I am dying of dehydration. So guys, a little bit shorter episode. Apologies for that. Hopefully, as I said, I will be moving to uh, to better quarters. Those of you who are avid listeners to this show do know that I am in the midst of house hunting a horrible, horrible, nightmarish experience with my uh, my wife. Nothing, it's nothing to do with my wife, by the way, that uh, makes it a nightmarish experience. It's just the sheer cost of of doing this unbelievable amount of uh, inflation in this marketplace. But like I said, hopefully I'll have a little bit better situation, and uh, I'm sure because we are going to Pork Fest next weekend, guys, and I hope to see. Many, many, many of you there. We will be there. We're doing our Libertarians in Living Rooms Drinking Liquor Special Whiskey Challenge, which we are going to 
do a live show of. We are going to tape it, but you will only have you will only be able to see some of the video feed if you are a uh, a subscribing member because that uh, that's something that probably most people shouldn't see. But we're doing our whiskey challenge, which is basically for those of you who don't know, a handle of whiskey split between two teams. So it's each team is a handle and three lions of liberty on the team. It is myself, it is John Odermatt, and it is JB Lubin versus the mysterious Rico who, yes, will be doing this entire challenge in a mask. (laughs) It will be Mark, and it will be the godfather of Liberty, as far as we're concerned, Howie Snowden. We will be matching up, seeing who can finish our handle of whiskey first. Pretty epic. And I will also be fielding the next day in Electric Liberty Land live recording, wherein I will probably be throwing up on the microphone at least half the time. So it's going to be an awesome time. And uh, I am sure that... We will get this house while I'm out of town, and uh, and it'll just be a complete nightmare for me. So we'll see. You know, good and bad in life. All right, guys, that's about to wrap it up. So I want to remind you, you can support our show by going to lionsofliberty.com forward slash support. We are on Patreon now. If you guys are on Podbean, our old program, please get off it. We are going to be turning that off. We're going to be cutting content off of that for a few weeks. We don't want to pay them no more money. We don't want to use them no more. We're going to Patreon. Much better audio quality. We can now send video out to people on Patreon. It is vastly superior. Please join us there. Please support the show. If you're new and want to support the show, come on board. We have incredible content. We do a show called Degenerate Gamblers with myself, Rico, and Odie. Talking gambling, talking crazy stories, taking all sorts of stuff. Bonus content. Mark's uh, League of Liberty show is on there. It's a good time. That's plus extra libertarians in living rooms drinking liquor shows. Can't miss those. So lionsofliberty.com forward slash support. Please do share the show. As I said in the beginning, we want to grow this as much as we can. And uh, of course, I just want to tell you all that I love you. All right, guys, for me, Brian McWilliams from Electric Liberty Land and from the Lions of Liberty, always stay plugged into Liberty. Wake up, punchy!